Well, thanks for filling us with the Christmas spirit, David. That was just, that was just wonderful. <laughs> Took a hike up the Wasatch. <laughs> to get a peek at life on the other side. <laughs> it was a little chilly this time going up, but invigorating, helping to crystallize my thoughts away from the madness of holiday preparation. There is so much these days that need a little clarity to help me understand the world. Now this, this fiscal cliff business <laughs> looms pretty large. And I wonder if John Boehner is now working on Plan C. <laughs> I think that Plan C might be something along the lines of tax increases for Obama and Michael Bloomberg only, <laughs> leaving everyone else out of the picture. But what I want to know, what I want to know is this. Why is it that when the wealthy want to balance the budget, by shredding social and entitlement programs, it's called an economic plan. And when the poor want the wealthy to pay their fair share of taxes, it's called class warfare. <laughs> That's what I want to know. Revolution number nine, number nine, number nine. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing really makes sense in government, and our legislature is no exception. Our legislative Republican majority have readily admitted, this is true, they have no problem with children seeing people waving guns and assault weapons outside their school classroom. But if a child sees a bartender pouring a drink, it would produce scarring damages for life for these children. <laughs> Our legislative Republican majority have said no to a school buffer zone where openly carried weapons would be prohibited, but they insist on a prohibition of restaurants that serve alcohol within 200 feet of a school. I think our legislative Republican majority could all use a nicely chilled martini to kind of just, <laughs> just think things over. You know, it would, be, it would be a public service if High West Distillery sent bottles of rendezvous whiskey to all the legislators as a gift to, to inspire a little more rational conversation. Well, you know, but such irrational thinking is not the sole province of our state legislature. I was thinking about the recent story out of California where some elementary schools have taken to teaching the kids yoga. Everyone has noticed the calming effect it has on these kids. But a bunch of evangelical parents don't like it and will put an end to teaching yoga in public schools in California. They claim that yoga nudges their children closer to Hindu beliefs a clear violation of the First Amendment. <laughs> These evangelical parents know exactly what they're talking about. They claim that yoga is not merely stretching, but teaching their children inner peace. <laughs> really, let me quote exactly. This is from the evangelical group. This is, hard, this is an exact quote. Once a child finds inner peace, then anything can happen. <laughs> I, I never thought of inner peace as, as subversive, but, but maybe it is. I mean, I mean, think about it. Look what would happen if the Utah legislature found inner peace. They would possibly want to preserve the wilderness and commune with nature. Inner peace can just ruin a person. When I reached the top of the Wasatch, trying to find a little inner peace myself, I had an extraordinary view into Puyallup, Washington. I never heard of that town. I don't even know how to pronounce it. 
But there's some real subversive stuff happening there, and it has to do with Christmas trees. A bunch of foresters, plant pathologists and biologists are trying to genetically alter the Christmas tree. They want to put an end to Christmas trees dropping their needles. Now, you may not know that a seven-foot evergreen will bear 350,000 needles, but you undoubtedly do know that by the end of the Christmas holiday season, most of those needles will be on your floor. <laughs> so there is this Christmas tree lab in Puyallup, Washington, which should be paying attention to other Christmas matters, like figuring out old, old debates of whether you should hang candy canes facing left or right. <laughs> but I guess that's too much of a political hot potato. <laughs> so instead, they're trying to solve the riddle of keeping the damn needles on the tree. The research thus far has run up a tab of $1.3 million. But this is peanuts, because the intent is to save the Christmas tree industry, which runs a billion dollars a year. People are growing disinclined to buy Christmas trees because of those needles. And so the purchase of artificial trees has spread to one-third of all households in America. Thank God we have scientists intervening to save our country from becoming completely artificial at Christmas time. <laughs> when I returned to the valley, I thought that, you know, cleaning up Christmas tree needles was all part of the tradition. I cannot imagine removing a Christmas tree on New Year's Day without having to vacuum. Of course, this will adversely affect the vacuum cleaner business, and so there's just no winning, I think. But you know, the people in Utah, a people grown used to all kinds of weird behavior, would object, would not object, to cleaning up Christmas tree needles. Because we are a purist lot, in the good sense of the word, objecting to genetically altered food, genetically altered Christmas trees, genetically altered anything because so many of us come from good pioneer stock that have learned to deal with every kind of adversity. May Christmas tree needles, all 350,000 of them, be the worst thing we have to put up with. Which goes to prove once again that Utah is the one place you have to leave in order to discover just how much you really love it. The offering will now gratefully be received, a way to say thank you to these wonderful musicians. <laughs>